Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome back to the seminar. Are you happy to be back this evening? Are you sure you are happy to be back this evening? All right. I am excited to be here, too. It's always good to be with uh, folks who, who, who just love the word of God, who love to, to uh, study uh, the book, the good book, the Bible, and especially these uh, messages that we are looking at from the book of Revelation. I just love sharing with you all and delving into the book of Revelation. I just want to welcome you again. We are at evening number seven, lesson number seven. I want to welcome those of you who are online. It, I know that there is a lively community online, and especially when it comes on to the q and I know that you will light up the chat and that you will keep our hosts busy. And I just want to uh, let you know that we appreciate you and we are happy that you are here with us during this seminar. Now, this evening, we are going to be looking at the uh, seal of God. It is a crucial message. All messages in Revelation that we have looked at so far are crucial. But I want you to pay attention to this uh, message. You will see why in a short while I emphasize the importance of this. And I want you to Remember that as you learn these new truths, that you share them with your friends, with your family members, your co-workers. Why not invite them to this seminar? Why not send out the link uh, in your WhatsApp groups? You know, share that um, YouTube channel uh, link. You know, put it in your status. And so that your friends can come and hear this good news that we are unearthing from the book of Revelation. As we begin this evening, we are going to begin with prayer. We, we, never, we dare not open the word of God without asking God to help us understand his message for us. And so at this time, I ask that you bow your heads with me as we pray. Eternal Father, we come to you once more asking for your guidance, asking for your leading as we open your word. Bless your people tonight, we pray, and may we have a wonderful time in the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We are looking at Revelation seal of God, the seal of God. It's good to see you, Jason. Uh, we missed you yesterday. Yes, but we know that you sent your friend. And um, so we met him yesterday. Um, but we are happy that you are here with us uh, today. And um, I know that I'm seeing some visitors that were missing, Christopher, if you are here in online, you know, uh, we, we miss you. Uh, is Rebecca here? I don't see Rebecca. Uh, she was here yesterday, and I know that she answered, you know, some questions, but we're missing them tonight. Oh, well, it's early days yet. Yeah? Maybe they will come, but I know that there are other visitors that, uh, you know, that, that are missing in action tonight. But if you are listening online, I just want to know that we miss you and we are looking forward to seeing you soon. God's seal of protection. The seal of God. I'm going to invite you to open up your lessons as we look at question one. The first question is, what question is asked 
about the people who will be alive at the second coming of Christ. What question is asked about the people who will be alive at the second coming of Christ? Remember when Christ was on earth and he said, speaking of his coming, his second coming, he asked, will the Son of Man find faith on the earth when he comes the second time? Who remembers that question? Oh, somebody remembers that question. Yes, in the Gospels, uh, will the Son of Man find faith? But in the book of Revelation, there is a similar question that is being asked about those who are living at the time of Christ's return. A similar question was asked in the book of Malachi, Malachi chapter 3. We touched on it on Wednesday night, but we want to look at the one from Revelation chapter 6. And Zachary will read it for us tonight, Revelation 6, verse 14 through 7, well, verses 14 through 17. Zachary. All right, the technical team is working on Zachary's mic. Let, we, let us let it, use my mic. Revelation, four, Revelation 6, verse 14 to 17. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? All right. Well, what's the question? Who shall be able to stand. So that is a question asked just before Jesus comes. And the next verse or the next verses will give us the answer. It, they will tell us who will be able to stand. And so question two who will be able to stand in the last days when Jesus comes? Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3. Zachary, read it for us again. Revelation 7, verses 1 to 3. And, I, and after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Okay. So, what do we see? We see four angels holding back the winds of strife. Which tells us that just before Jesus comes, winds of strife are going to blow on earth. Winds of strife. And it is consistent with the rest of end time prophetic books. Because we read in the book Daniel. Daniel is also an end time prophecy book. Apocalyptic is the pretty name for it. Yes. It is an end time book. And in the final chapter of Daniel... 
it speaks of a time of trouble such as never was before Jesus comes. And so it is consistent. Revelation 7 is consistent with Daniel. Uh, it harmonizes with Daniel chapter 12 to tell us that um, momentous things are going to occur just before Jesus comes. But before it happens, Revelation tells us that an angel comes from the east with what? With the? The? The seal of the seal of the living God. And he will place the seal in where? In the? In the foreheads of who? Of the saints. Yes. Right. So this is the imagery that you are seeing. The angel coming from the east. I'm speaking to the four angels that are holding back the winds of strife. And there is a lesson that we will, um, we will look at sometime next week. We will look at that lesson that speaks about these events that will burst upon planet earth just before Jesus comes. But the good news is that before all of this happens, God will do a sealing among his people that anyone who will be going to heaven, anyone who will be alive at that time, will experience the sealing process. So we are going to look at what the sealing is about. It is critical. And that is why I said earlier that we need to pay attention to this sealing message. So number three, what has God consistently required to be placed in the hearts or the minds of his people? Now, in the Bible, you often see God putting things, saying um, that things, he'll put things in people's heart. Or from the heart proceeds Certain things, thoughts, good, evil thoughts are, and good thoughts and, you know, and emotions and so forth. Obviously, God isn't talking about the, the heart, the pump in the chest as we know it. But the heart is used to, uh, to represent what other organ do you think? Redu, redu, Thoughts reside in the, in the brain. Yes, absolutely, or the mind. So in the Bible, you see God putting things in the heart. Sometimes it says mind, or sometimes it says the frontlets between your eyes. Right? Have you ever seen that in the Bible? Yes, right. So yeah, man. So we're going to look at um, scripture. So when you see these things, you know exactly what we're talking about. So the question is, what has God consistently required to be placed in, 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 in the hearts, in the hearts of his people? And we're going to look at a number of texts and see if we can identify a pattern. So Zachary will read first Job 22, verse 22. Zachary? Job 22, verse 22. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. All right. So Job said that uh, we receive the law from where? From his, from his mouth. And lay up his words in his, in thine, in your heart. Yes, so we receive 
um, the law from God's mouth and his word, and we, we lay them up in our hearts. That's one. Next text, Psalm 37, verses 29 through 31. Psalm 37, 29 through 31. Zach. Psalms 27, verses 31, verse 29 to 31. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. All right. Who shall inherit the land? The whom? The, the righteous shall inherit the land. All right. We know that in Israel of old, in Bible times, God promised the land, the land of Canaan to his people, that they, if, if they were obedient, would dwell safely in the land, to the land of promise. But when God speaks of inheritance and inheriting the land, was he only talking about the promised land in the Old Testament? Or is there a deeper meaning? Is there another land that God has in mind for his people? And are his people only, you know, um, confined to Israel? Or is his people broader? than the Jews, the Israelites. Let us think about that. Huh? Now say I'm thinking it's the heavenly home because it says dwell, inherit, inherit the land and dwell therein forever. So I'm thinking it's the heavenly home. Aha, uh -huh. all right. Okay. okay, yes. Let me, let me, I'm going to come to you. I like to hear the different voices. Let the people on YouTube hear the voices. Okay, the, um, the righteous of God shall inherit the earth. They shall live with God here on this earth forever. Okay. All right. All right. Yes, yes, getting warm. People are thinking. Yes. Oops. So, oh, I thought you wanted to say something more. So, yes, the, um, though in the Old Testament, the land of Palestine, you know, that some of the countries are fighting over right now, you know, <laughs> that real estate, the most, the most um, sought after a piece of real estate and fought over real estate. Though that was, was promised to Abraham and given to the Israelites of old and, and these promises spoke to them. But there is a deeper meaning, you see. When we read these passages, we have to think. And as you said, um, Anne, that... The righteous, a text says that the righteous will dwell in it for, uh, forever. We have to remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10. That those things that we see written in the Old Testament are examples and they are shadows. They are types of the real thing that is to come the real promises that are to be fulfilled in the time of the end, right? So when we read some of the, with these promises, we bear that in mind. So the righteous who will inherit the land are ultimately the saved from all nations 
who will enter and live in the heavenly Canaan, in the heavenly promised land. That is the real promised land. That is the real Canaan. It is in heaven. And so we go back to the text because that was an aside. So the righteous shall inherit the hand, the, the, sorry, the land. Verse 31. The law of God is where? In his? In his heart or his? Mind. Yes. Yes. Right. Psalm 40, verse 8. Zachary? Psalms 40 and verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. The righteous delight to do God's will. Okay? Why? Because his law, God's law, is where? In the righteous heart. Yes. Do we see a pattern so far? Huh? Yes. We continue. Isaiah 51, verse 7. Isaiah 51 and verse 7. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. Hearken unto me, ye that know what? They know what? They know righteousness. Why do they know righteousness? Because God's law is where? In their heart. We go again to the Bible. Jeremiah 31 verse 33. Jeremiah is a prophet in the Old Testament. And he is looking forward to the time when Jesus comes to, to make a new covenant with his people. Jer Let us hear what Jeremiah says. Jeremiah 31 verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. So, Jeremiah speaking about the new covenant when the covenant is renewed when after Jesus comes and ratifies it on the on the cross he says that he will God will put his laws there in their in their inward parts and write his laws where in their hearts do we see the pattern? New Testament. Because some will say, what Andrew, you're quoting pure Old Testament texts. Even though the, the keen reader and observer would notice, uh, speaks to the New Testament about what God will do in the New Testament. But let, let us look at what Hebrews says. So let's go to the New Testament itself to hear what the word of God says. So Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. So God says in the new covenant that, I will make, that he will make with the house of Israel after those days. Uh, and of course, of course, of course, of course, of Israel here 
is God's church. Because this is after the crucifixion, you know, Christ would have already died. The gospel would have gone to the Gentiles and the apostles would be now referring to the believers in Jesus as the household of Israel. Remember Paul says in Galatians uh, chapter, is it chapter 2 I believe or is it chapter 3? I'll have to double check that. But you know the text, some of you know the text that I'm thinking about where Paul says that uh, if we are Christ's, then we are of, we are of Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Yes. He says repeatedly that a Jew is not one outwardly, but one who is circumcised in the heart. It's spiritual. Jesus himself said that the time is coming when the kingdom of God, the privilege of uh, the kingdom of God being preached exclusively by the Jews would come to an end. It would be taken away from them and given to the Gentiles. It was Jesus himself who said it. And we know that it is so because Daniel prophesied it from Daniel chapter 9 verses 23 to 27. We read it on Wednesday evening that, uh, that a certain time was cut off for the children of Israel, for the nation of Israel to put an end to sin, bring in everlasting um, righteousness, welcome the Messiah, um, seal up the prophecy. And we saw that this occurred when Jesus came on the scene, when he was baptized and began his ministry, when he was cut off for his people. And three and a half years afterwards, when the first Christian martyr was executed, the probation for Israel as God's chosen people came to an end and God's instrument on earth since that beyond that is his church. So all the promises that pertain to Israel in the Old Testament after the cross now pertains to his church. And that is why Peter could say, uh, using the same words that Moses wrote in Exodus in regard to God's people, that you are now a holy nation, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. This is the Gentiles. So the Gentile, the Christian church, is now the household of Israel. Right? So it is no marvel that in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, Paul quotes Jeremiah. Because we, read the, we pretty much read the same thing in Jeremiah 31. It's really the same thing that Paul was repeating. And if you read the writings of Paul, I mean, Paul's Bible was the Old Testament. And anything that he was preaching, he corroborated it from the Old Testament, you see. So, yes. So, what did Paul say? What did Paul say? No, but, you know, let's, let's go back there. <laughs> he said, I will, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and then they shall be to me a people. So do we see the consistency all throughout the Bible? That the thing that God puts in people's hearts are his laws and his words. In other places in the Bible, they call it 
the law and the testimony. That's it. That's it. And no wonder Jesus says, you know, when Satan tried to, to tempt Jesus, to tempt him in the wilderness. And that is why I just love Jesus so. Jesus, Paul says, is the second Adam. And where Adam had all the advantages of, of Edenic bliss, when the earth was created, everything to his advantage, he allowed Satan to come and, well, he wasn't deceived. You know, he, well, Eve allowed him to deceive her, Satan. And then Adam fully well knew, knew, um, knowing, you know, what, that it was wrong, went along with it. He never had the moral backbone to stand up for what is right, you see. But the Bible tells us, Paul tells us that Jesus, being the second Adam, right? Notice that it was the word of God, what God told Adam and Eve. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they failed to obey. They failed to listen, to follow God's word. But Jesus, the second Adam, when he got his test, it was not in a garden, but it was in a wilderness among the jagged rocks in the desert heat, hungry. Adam and Eve were filled. They were full. But Jesus was hungry and weak. And but the Bible said when Satan came with his temptation, Jesus quoted the word of God and said, it is written, man shall not live by what? By bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that, my friends, is the challenge. That is the issue. Will man live by the word of God? And that is why God is, says, is saying throughout the Bible, I am putting my words in your heart. Will you obey? That is the issue. Question four. What did God command should be sealed among his disciples. Isaiah 8, verse 16. Zach, will you read it for us? Isaiah 8, verse 16. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. God said in Isaiah chapter 8, bind up the testimony and seal the law among my disciples. Do you notice the similarity in the words? Do you notice the same language being used in Revelation 7? The thing that God seals up among his disciples is his law. That is what the Bible says. In your lessons, you have a picture of a seal. And the image is that, that of a justice of the peace seal. I am very familiar with it. Um, I see Sefton Brown smiling. I, 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 I'm assuming that he's a, he's a justice of, of the peace. Ah, yeah. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> yes. So that explains the smile because it is very familiar to him. Right. Yes. So it is a seal. Yes. And I, I am very familiar with it too. You know. No, I am no JP. I don't know people, some, some, some members, some people from this church come with the documents. You know, Elder, I wanted to sign something for me. Um, like why? 
Aren't you a JP? No, I'm not. So this is an advertisement. I'm not a, I'm not a JP. But, <laughs> but my father was a JP. And I was his de facto secretary. So, <laughs> yes. So I used to, you know, type the letters for him and him, he would sign and seal it. So I know the seal. And I recalled the seal. But this is a new seal. Uh, it, there was an older seal that was limited to the parishes. And we'll talk about that. But this one, this new seal, is what we're going to look at now. The purpose of the seal, you see, is when you have official documents, you know, documents that you need to submit to the government, to official um, agencies, you know, they want to know that you are who you are. They want to, a JP, a justice of the peace, or somebody in authority to authenticate or to to recommend you or to say that you are the person that you are. And so when that justice of the peace signs in the signature line, they want to see a seal because the justice of the peace should only, well, he would have or her seal and that seal is available to anybody else so that when they put their seal over their signature or on the paper, it tells the person who is reading that indeed this is genuine because the, the person of authority has put their seal on this document. And so let us look at the seal and let's look at the elements of a seal. What is a seal? Well, what are the elements? You see the title of the person. In this case, the person, the title of the person is Justice of the Peace, right? You also see the name. Somebody said, what I don't say the name. <laughs> Only that. <laughs> Only that. You will see a unique number there. And let, and let us say, if I could borrow from the Bible, that the number is the number of his name or her name. <laughs> yes, in a reference to Revelation 30, right? Talking about the bees. Right, so the number represents the JP's name because it is unique. And more than one JP might have the same name and all of that and what have you. So the number is really the name. So you have the title, Justice of the Peace, and then you have the name below the coat of arms. That Jamaica, which is Jamaica's official insignia. And then you have the territory over which the, the justice of the peace has jurisdiction. And in this case, it is the entire Jamaica. Back in the days when I was the secretary, the, the East JP from each parish had the territory being their parish. So if it was a JP from St. Andrew, it would say, St. Andrew, where you see Jamaica. Yes. Right. And it was that way, but it was problematic because sometimes people down in Hanover would produce a document with a JP from St. Thomas. And then one would have to ask, how is it that you live in Hanover and then the JP that is authenticating this, this document all the way in St. Thomas at the next end of the island? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that is all changed though. So they just put Jamaica. Right. Yes. So those are the elements of the seal. The name, the title, and the, the territory. That is on the seal. Now, God gave, we have been seen, we saw the texts where God says that he, that he puts his laws, his law, his words in the hearts. In God's law, the Ten Commandments, which, by the way, he wrote with his own fingers, 
the Bible says in Exodus chapter 31, written by the finger of God, those things, the Ten Commandments, which is the only part of the Bible that God wrote himself. But then, te but technically, somebody will say, but Elder, I went through a thing, you know, what about in Daniel, when the, when the unseen hand wrote on the wall? You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we're talking about a document now. Right? <laughs> yes. So, it is the only part that God wrote himself. And he told Moses to put the tables of stone in the ark, which we spoke about last week. Now, now, in the commandments, in the heart of the commandments, there is a seal that tells us who the commandments came from, over which jurisdiction he rules, and what his name is. Just like any official document, this is the most serious document. The document that God himself wrote. And so you would expect that it would have a seal. So let's look at it. How does the Sabbath commandment show the seal of God is a question. Let's look at the Sabbath commandment. Exodus 20, 8 through 11. Zachary will read it for us. Let's examine it. Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do no work or any labor, not do any labor. Thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger which is in thy gauge. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the seas and all that, that, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. All right, thank you. So we heard, we have heard it. So let's examine it. Do we see a title in these commandments? Was there a title? Did anybody see the title? What is the title? What is the title? The? the yes, he is the? The creator. The creator. What is his name? The? The Lord thy God. Yes, we see it. It is he who is giving these commandments. And what is his territory? The heaven, the earth, what else? The sea, yes? And all that in them is. Yes. The whole universe. Because he is the creator. And it is the creator that is speaking. And so this is his seal. This is his sign that he gives to his people. That they will know that he is their God. Ezekiel chapter 20. Now, let's talk about the Sabbath. The Sabbath seal. Question 7. When did God create the Sabbath? Genesis 1, sorry, Genesis 2, 1 through 3 tells us. Zachary, we'll read it for us. Zachary? Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. 
and okay. God ble- yes and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made so the question is when did God introduce this Sabbath to planet Earth? The first week of creation. Yes, the first week of creation. So when he wrote it in the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai when Moses went upon the mount. That wasn't the first time the Sabbath was being introduced to planet Earth. As a matter of fact, the commandments begin with the word remember. So in order to, for you to remember something, it had to be there before. So it wasn't something new. But as we read in the narrative of Genesis, the, of the creation, the narrative of the creation story, the Sabbath was introduced in the first week of creation, the first week of Earth's history, the week of creation. Now, which leads me to the next question. What made the Sabbath different from the other six days? We're going to read it again, Genesis 2, but this time verses 2 and 3. Genesis 2, 2 and 3. Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he created, he rested from all his work which God created and made. All right. So the Bible said in verse 3 that God did what? What did he do to the day? He blessed it. And sanctified it. We are intelligent, bright people. So I'm going to ask these questions. Did God bless and sanctify the third day? No. You sure you never, you never saw that in the Bible? Are you sure about that? What about the fourth day? No. The fifth? No. <laughs> you have to think about that one. <laughs> there was only one day of the week that the Bible said that God blessed and sanctified. So he did something special to that day. So that day is not an ordinary day. It is not a common day. It is a special day because God made it so. It is he who sanctified it himself and blessed it. Separated it from the other days. And this is crucial, you know. I'm going to raise it later. By God's grace, I'm going to try to remember that point that is in my head. So, yes. So, he made it um, different from the other days because he blessed it and he sanctified it. Now, now according to Mark 27, 28, for whom was the Sabbath made? Mark 20, sorry, Mark chapter 2, 27 and 28. Zachary, please read it for us. Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. And he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Thank you. So, Jesus speaking in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 2 says 
that the Sabbath was made for whom? It wasn't made for a particular nation. It wasn't made for a tribe. It wasn't made for a certain language group. The Sabbath was made for mankind, for man, and given to the human race from creation. So my friend, it is er erroneous to say that the Sabbath was given to the Jews by Moses. That it was a commandment from Moses given to the Jews. And it is for the Jews only. No. As a matter of fact, Lord help me. I don't know why I always try to get myself in trouble. But Holy Spirit, be with me. The song says, Holy Spirit, come down and help your servant now. Because I'm going to try to find a text. And I believe it is in Isaiah 56. If this old brain can think straight. Yes. So let me go to Isaiah chapter 56. And let me look at that text where it says, verse 3. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Let's look at it. Isaiah 56, verse 3. Neither let the son of man, sorry, neither let the son of this stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from, the, from his people. And neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. So let me stop there first. Who is a stranger in the Bible, in the Old Testament? Who was a stranger? Come on, somebody tell me quick. Who is a stranger? Who was a stranger? Everybody kind of whispering, you know. I, have, I found a brave man. Tell me. Anybody other than a Jew. Anybody other than a Jew was a stranger. Yes. So let's look back at the next verse and the text now. Isaiah 56. We're going to look at verse 4 now. So the first part says, um, The son of the stranger should not say that the Lord hath utterly separated him from his people. But look at verse 4. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that, that what? That keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me. So, the Sabbaths and even the covenant that was given to the Jews were not only for them, but they were for the strangers too. As a matter of fact, the Jews were to be conduits. They were the repositories of God's law and his words. And they were to share it with the rest of the world. But they did a very poor job of that. And that is why God had to fire them in AD 34. And give the work to a nation that will produce fruits. Jesus, Matthew chapter 21. So, the Sabbath was made for the human race. The human race. Number 10, are the commandments mentioned in the New Testament? The commandment laws, these laws of, of God. You know, we're talking about what God has consistently said that he wants to put in the minds of his people. Right? So we want to know that if the Ten Commandments, his laws that he wrote with his own finger, were they mentioned in the New Testament or were they abrogated? Were they annulled? Were they cancelled when Jesus comes? But let us look what the Bible says in the New Testament. Zachary will read Luke chapter 16. 
verse 17. Luke chapter 16, verse 17. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one title of the law to fail. So Jesus says that before one title, that is the, the stroke of a T in the law can pass, it is easier for earth and heaven, not even earth alone, but earth and heaven to pass away before one little stroke of the law fails. That is what Jesus says. In another place, he, he tells us in Matthew chapter 5, that think not that I have come to destroy the law and the what? The law and the prophets. The same thing again, the law and the rest of the Bible. I have not come to destroy them, but I have come to fulfill them. Yes. So the Bible is consistent. And we read yesterday that in the judgment, the standard by which every human being will be judged is the Ten Commandments, James chapter 2. The law of liberty. The law of liberty. The Bible also tells us that sin, which is unrighteousness, is defined as the transgression of God's law. 1 John 3 verse 4. And Paul, the apostle of grace and faith, tells us that by law is the knowledge of sin. So no Bible worker, no Bible, what am I saying? Bible worker. <laughs> No New Testament Bible author has said anywhere that God's laws are annulled. But consistently, God himself says that he, you know, his desire is to put them in our inward parts, in our minds, in the frontlets, um, you know, between our eyes, in our mind, in our heart. That is where he puts them, his words, so that his people can obey them. Luke 4 verse 16. Look at what the Bible says Jesus did. Zachary will read Luke 4 16 for us. Luke 4 verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for it to read. The Bible said that as his custom was, Jesus, and as a matter of fact, this is speaking of Jesus, you know, and he, capital H, came to Nazareth. It is Jesus, and his custom was that he would go into the synagogue or the church, the temple, on the Sabbath day. There is an old hymn that I like in the, in, it's in, our, it's in this, our church hymnal, you know, that I would be like Jesus. You know, be like Jesus, this my song, in the home and in the throne. Be like Jesus all the day long, I would be like Jesus. And if Jesus' custom was to worship on Sabbath, he was to attend church on Sabbath, then I want to be like Jesus. And before you, I take your, your point, um, Patricia, the thought came to me, there was something that I, I needed to come back to. Because there is a popular TV evangelist speaking about the Sabbath question, the Sabbath issue, that says, you know, that he worships on Monday, on Wednesday, on Friday, and he even worships on Sabbath too. So, there is, no, there is no need to emphasize um, the Sabbath. And you all know who I'm talking about. You know, <laughs> God, you know, <laughs> God bless him, <laughs> his soul. Because, you know, in times of ignorance, God wings, wings, you know, he wings at him, you know. But when you see the truth, when you hear the truth, you must repent. So I want to come back to that. I too worship on Sunday. I had worship this morning. I'm going to worship tomorrow morning. And in the evening too. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I worship. 
I worship God every day too. But that is not the issue. The Bible says that on the Sabbath day, that the only thing that you sh should do is to worship God. That, is, that day is reserved for God only because it is, it is blessed, it is sanctified, it is set apart by God and we must do no ordinary work, no servile work on that day. That is the difference, my friends. And that that day is for a holy convocation. You see, that is the difference. So, we worship God every day. But we must work. We must, you know, if we're going to eat bread, we must work and do our ordinary things. But that day is different. And no man can change it. No matter how many, how many PhDs are behind his name, or how, how many bishops, our fathers, they put in front of his name. No man can change it. And these men, they say and they do things that even Satan dare not do. Satan wouldn't be so presumptuous like some of these men. Question 12. Did Jesus intend to change the Sabbath? Matthew 24, 20. Zachary, will you read it for us? Matthew 24 and verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So Jesus, looking in the future and seeing the tribulation that the church would go through, said he prays that the, Lord, that the, the flight of the Christians when those troublous times come will not be on the Sabbath day. So Jesus intended for his people to be keeping the Sabbath in the future. The future from his day. All right? We hasten on. 13. Did the apostles and the early Christians change the law of God or did they worship on the Sabbath? Acts 17, verse 2. Zachary? Acts, Acts 17, verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. All right. So some said, okay, Jesus was addressing the Jews and um, the disciples were Jewish. But, um, but Paul, Paul is the apostle of, to the Gentiles and, um, you know, and Paul has, you know, it was Paul who, I suppose, brought in the change. But what did the Bible say? Um, what did the Bible say? These, these early Christians did Paul and um, his fellows. As his manner was, he went unto them. When? How many times? Three Sabbaths and reason in the scriptures. So some say, well, Paul was reasoning with the Jewish Christians in the different cities. So let's go again. Question 14. Did the Gentile Christians worship in the Sabbath? Acts 13, 42 and verse 44. Read it for us, Zach. Acts 13, verses 42 and 44. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And the next Sabbath day came. Almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of God. So, the Bible says that the Gentiles, the who? The, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached on them the next when? Gentile Christians kept the Sabbath. Jews and Gentiles, Jesus and apostles. You see. So when we look at the Christian world today, 
when you have over 3 billion, or just about 3 billion Christians, they're about. And the majority worships on a Sunday. You have to ask why and what is happening there. Revelation addresses that. And I want us to stick with us this week. We are going to be talking about Mystery Babylon. We are going to be talking about the mark of the beast. And we are going to see how these issues play a part in end time events. And I hope you have, you have seen so far how this Sabbath question is critical. Because it is a part of the preparatory work that God will do in the believers who will be alive before Jesus comes. It plays a crucial part. And we are going to see how the issues collide as we go through the lessons this week. Question 15. Why do we worship God according to Revelation 4, 11 and Revelation 5, verse 9? Why do we worship God? Revelation 4, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Revelation 5, verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Okay. So we worship God because first, because he created us. And he is due our worship. We worship him again because he redeems us. He is our savior. Now, do you know what the Bible says is the sign, the seal, or the mark that God created us and that God saves us? Let us see what the Bible says. Exodus 31 verse 16. Exodus 31 verse 16 and 17 and, and 17 wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual convent con covenant it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever for in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed so the Bible says that he gave us his Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. So when we accept God's salvation by faith, when we confess our sins and we accept the sacrifice of Jesus and he justifies us, we accept that by faith. And then when he sanctifies us, that he makes us holy and gives us overcoming power and the indwelling Christ to live holy lives. When we accept that by faith and rest in it, we commemorate that by observing the seventh day Sabbath. That is what Paul tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 that there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. It is a rest of faith. And he said that that rest, they rest from their works just as how God rested when he created earth and he refers to Genesis chapter 2. So it is a commemoration of righteousness by faith. The Sabbath. Next text, uh, uh, Ezekiel 20, verse 12. 
Ezekiel 20 verse 12. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Okay, so that speaks about him sanctifying us again, the sign that he sanctifies us. So over and throughout the Bible, that is the sign of God's sanctification work in us. And, and prior in Ezekiel 31, 17, it talks about uh, it is a sign or a token that we believe and know that the Lord made heaven and earth in six days, the creator. The Bible is consistent, but we hasten to question 17. According to the book of Revelation, what urgent message will be proclaimed to every person on earth in the last days just before Jesus comes? Revelations 14, 6 and 7. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. We read it before. We read it yesterday. The three angels' messages before he comes, the everlasting gospel. And notice in verse 7 that it says that the hour of his judgment is come. But we, and we are to worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. It is the last call before Jesus comes to a dying world to worship the creator. The one who created us. Now, in verse 7. Where do those words sound like they come from? We have heard them before and we have read them since this evening. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the seas, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Where did we see those words before? We saw it where? Let me hear you. In, in where? In Exodus 20, in the Sabbath commandment. So that is, um, you know, boring. The, the, the Rev, John the Revelator or the message is being borrowed or drawn from the Sabbath commandment. And that is a part of the last message that is to be preached to the world, the dying world, to look back to the Creator and we commemorate his, his um, creative powers. By accepting the seal, his Sabbath seal in the commandments. How does Isaiah say the redeemer will worship God in the new earth? Our last text, Isaiah 66, verse 22. Zachary? Isaiah 66, verse 22. For as the new heavens and new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. Sorry, and verse 23. Verse 23. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. All right. So as the what God will make? As the what? Verse 22. As the? The new what? The new heavens and the? And the new earth. It's talking about new heaven and the new earth. The Bible is clear, plain English. And in verse 23, it says that from one Sabbath, from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, and from one new moon to another, shall, shall, shall how many flesh come before me, said the Lord? All flesh come before me, says the Lord of hosts. I can't say it any better than the word of God itself. And so, my dear friends, question 19. Are you willing to ask the Lord to bind his seal in your heart so that you will lovingly serve him by keeping his Sabbath holy as a sign that he created and redeemed 
us. In these last days, it, was, it is boiled down to a matter of loyalty to whom we belong. Are we going to obey what our creator says? Are we going to be obedient to his word and his laws? And are we going to keep his Sabbath holy as a commemoration that he is the creator who created this earth in six literal days? And that is important in these last days because there is a new teaching, my friends, that God, that God never created the earth. The earth evolved from nothing. And that there are some Christians who try to mix the error with truth to say that the earth was created, but it was created to, through scientific processes over millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years in, in six different epochs of time. But that is not what the Bible says. That is devil philosophy. Because the Bible tells that my God spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood forth. And he did it in six literal days. And we are not taking away anything from our God. Because our God is a mighty God and the almighty God. And when we keep his Sabbath holy, it is a token and it is a commemoration that we believe and we testify, we attest to the fact that we serve the living and the mighty God. And when champions are few in these last days, when people will be disloyal, God will have a people to stand up for him and will receive his seal and will be fitted for glory. And my prayer is that all of us here will be ready to accept his words and follow him. And so will you ask him to prepare you to be able to stand when he appears, ready to meet him with his seal planted in your, your hearts, in your minds, willing to serve him gladly. This is my prayer for you, my friends. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the light that you have given your people who are living in the dark last days of earth's history. We pray, Lord, that everyone under my voice will hear and understand the message tonight. And so that when the time comes, Lord, for the sealing work to be finished, when people will have to make a decision if they will obey you fully, I pray that everybody hearing my voice will gladly accept your seal and will say, Lord, here I am. Here I am, Lord. Seal me. I pray that you will continue to be with your people. Bless them, I pray, in all their endeavors. Continue to help them to delve deep into your word and to come to know Jesus more is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. That's it. We are now gone to the quiz. True or false? The ushers were, were on the ball this evening. And they, 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 they gave us envelopes, but I see they missed. They overlooked two hands, two hands right here. Ushers, almost, almost perfect. But that's all right. All right, so we are all set. Those online, online, online folks, you click on the link that is in the chat and you get it instantaneously. So number one, we are ready to go. Only those who have the seal of God will be able to stand when Jesus comes the second time. Is that true or false? Only those, watch me now, only those who have the seal of God will be able to stand when Jesus comes the second time. The second time. Number two. The purpose of a seal is to guarantee a document's authenticity. The purpose of a seal is to guarantee a document's authenticity.
the Sabbath was made at Mount Sinai and first given to Israel. The Sabbath was made at Mount Sinai and first given to Israel. Number four. In the early church, both Jewish and Gentile Christians kept the Sabbath holy. In the early church, both Gentile and Jewish Christians, or Jewish and Gentile Christians, kept the Sabbath holy. And five and last, the redeemed will keep the Sabbath in the new earth. The redeemed will keep the Sabbath in the new earth. I'm going to repeat them and give a clarification I heard. There's a need for a definition. So we go back to number one. Only those who have the seal of God will be able to stand when Jesus comes the second time. Number two, the purpose of a seal is to guarantee a document's authenticity. In other words, the purpose of the seal is to guarantee that a document is authentic. A document is genuine. A document is real. That is the purpose of the seal. All right? Break it down. That's what we are here to do. Number three, the Sabbath was made at Mount Sinai and first given to Israel. The Sabbath was made at Mount Sinai and first given to Israel. Number four, and I, I hope the ushers are standing by to collect ushers because we're winding on the quiz. Ushers, ushers, um, stand close to collect. In the early church, both Jewish and Gentile Christians kept the Sabbath holy. True or false? And number five and last, the redeemed will keep the Sabbath in the new earth. The redeemed will keep the Sabbath in the new earth. All right, those online, please click submit to close off your quiz. And I see people ready to hand in their quiz. Oh, the, these questions were easy. This is the fastest one that we have ever done. So I ex expect to see all five answers right. So let's go. Number one, only those who have the seal of God will be able to stand when Jesus comes the second time. Is that true or false? True. The answer is true. And so let's, and just let, me just, let me just clarify something here so that there is no misunderstanding in what I'm saying. That only those who are alive when Jesus comes. We're not talking about the dead um, in the past and all of that. But those who are alive, living on earth when he comes, will have the seal of God. I think the Bible was clear on that. Revelation 7 verses 1 through 3. Right? Number two. The purpose of a seal is to guarantee a document's authenticity or genuineness. The answer is true. Number three. The Sabbath was made at Mount Sinai and first given to Israel. The answer is false because the Sabbath was given to Adam at creation. Number four. In the early church, both Jewish and Gentile Christians kept the Sabbath holy. Is that true or false? True. Answer is true. And number five and last. The redeemed will keep the Sabbath in the new earth. Is that true or false? The answer, oh, yes, the answer is true. <laughs> yes. That was a typo. <laughs> yes, yes. That was a typo. Okay, Jason has a question. Okay, ask a question on, the, on YouTube. What would have been the early church for question four? And when would the recognition of the Gentiles take place? Okay. Yes, my friend beside me is also asking if you are using the same Bible as other denominations. <laughs> That's a very good question, the second one. Yes. 
So we use the same Bible pretty much. I use the text that I use are from the King James Version of the Bible. And I feel most comfortable using that version. And somebody please remember to ask me why on Sabbath. After the lesson on Sabbath morning, ask me why I use the King James Version. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to explain why at that time. Um, and to, to your first question, when we refer to the early church, when we, refer, when we refer to the early church, we speak of the church when it just started. And on, after Christ was ascended, after Christ ascended, the day of Pentecost, when the disciples started preaching Christ and um, spreading the good news in Jerusalem and the rest of Israel and then to the other parts of the world, in the days of the apostles, apostles like Peter and John and Paul, those, that era is what we refer to as the early church, you see. And it was in that time, it was um, three and a half years after Jesus was crucified that, uh, that, the, that the gospel went to the Gentiles in an official way, right? The, 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 the gospel was, as we saw even in Old Testament times, it wasn't, um, what is the word I'm looking for now? It, 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 it wasn't exclusive to the Jews, right? So the Gentiles were allowed that if they, if they heard the gospel, they were allowed to enter into the covenant relationship with God. And we read the ministry of Jesus that he did miracles for even the Gentiles. The Roman soldier who was a Gentile. Um, there was a Samaritan woman and there was another uh, another lady, I'm thinking her daughter was sick. The, the Syrophine, Syrophoenician woman, yes. The Syrophoenician woman, yes, 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 yes. She was a Gentile. So, but in AD 34, the, um, that was when officially Paul said, um, now that you have officially rejected the, 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 the gospel and rejected God, we now go to the Gentiles. And it was at that time that God's church, no longer Israel, but it is now his church, his, his, his um, Christian church, true church, yes. It is now time for Q&A. We jump right into it. Ron and Christina are here. Let me go get my Bible. <laughs> All right, Christine, do we have any questions? Yes, there's one. Good. One and question, okay. It comes from Joel on Facebook. Did you say the angels of Revelation 7 are human beings? If so, explain. If not, please explain who they are. And this is from Joel. Okay, no, I didn't, I don't recall me saying that they, that they were humans. I'm trying to wonder why though he would say that if I'd said something that was ambiguous. But um, no, I, I would have no reason to say that, um, that the angels in... Revelation chapter 7 are human beings. Okay. Yeah. And if not, please explain who they are. They are angels. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, the, the second question, and this is from Tanya on Zoom, and this is from yesterday. Please, um, Rome always has been and always shall be the enemy of God from their rising to the end of time. Herod, Rome's appointee, tried to kill baby Jesus. Jesus was crucified on a Roman cross by Roman hands. During the Dark Ages, Rome tried and tries still to usurp his authority and place thinking to change times and laws and presenting as Jesus' representative on earth. At the end of time, Rome shall persecute its remnant church. Rome always as itself against God then. Wow. Someone's like Tanya has given me the, is um, <laughs> giving us a preview of what is to come. <laughs> Probably Tanya should come and assist in the, in the, in the presentation. Uh, you know, I, lo I love that, but I love when she's engaged and, um, and we're gonna speak more to that. Um, coming, uh, starting on Wednesday, we are going to be looking at some of these things in more details about um, 
what happens to God's attacks on God's church and also um, you know what God expects of his people in those final moments of earth's history um, and so Tanya stay tuned um, you will enjoy it. all right the next question please explain this let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come but the body is of christ corinthians 2 16 to 23 and this is joel on facebook okay so i've been talking all evening so maybe <laughs> you and ron would, would uh, <laughs> can, <laughs> can, can take that one go ahead christine <laughs> All right, so um, I know it says, let no man, let us read the text again. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the bodies of Christ. Now, this, um, when we look at it, talking about in meat and drink, so they are not talking about the... Ten Commandments, right? It seems that they're talking about the ceremonial, laws. the ceremonial laws, right? And and what these um, things that were done um, as a way of dealing with the sin problem. Yes. You know, so yes. these were um, prescriptions then for you how to deal with any time you transgress the moral law so that is that is how i would begin i don't okay. know if ron or andrew want well, to i would just emphasize that even the aspect of it that refers to the sabbath days mm -hmm. was not dealing with the seventh day sabbath it had to do with the ceremonial sabbath also and the fact that i even mentioned new moons i know some people still allude to isaiah to try and strengthen that which was a shadow or a type pointing to when Christ came and fulfilled all these things. Yes, so I would, I would say, and just to, to buttress what was said uh, before, remember we, we spoke about these shadows um, that were in place, that God uh, commanded Moses to tell Israel to keep as object lesson, to teach teaching aids, to, to teach about the plan of salvation, what God would do in the sanctuary. And so when Christ came, Christ was a fulfillment of those. And so there was no more need for, um, for, the Christ, for people to um, practice those. So the Jews who were imposing on new Christians, especially the Gentile Christians, that they were to keep the, um, these holy days and these meat offerings and drink offerings. And circumcision. Uh, the circumcision. What Paul was saying was that you, can, don't, you cannot judge anybody by those things um anymore um and ron mentioned about sabbath days remember now that the feast days any days that a feast day would fall on was considered a sabbath and it was to be treated as just as you would the sabbath of the seventh commandment no work from from sundown um on the sixth day to the sundown the seventh day and all of that these were sabbaths now when when um the the, the, when, the day when Christ was crucified, which was the Passover, the day that the Passover fell on um, was to be treated like a Sabbath. And, um, and the day of unleavened bread, the day of the wave sheep, the Pentecost. And what Paul is saying now is that those days are now nailed to the cross. They are passed away. They are no longer necessary to keep. But not the seventh day Sabbath, which is a part of God's um, Ten, Commandments. Ten Commandments, the moral law, which will be kept even in the new earth. Excuse me. I find context very important. Colossians 2, 14 through to 16. It is clear that Paul is referring to the ceremonial law. In yes. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 26, Moses told them to put the ceremonial law in the side of the ark. And he said that these are going to witness against you. Now, what did Jesus nail to the cross? 
taking away the writings and ordinances yes. that were against yes. us. Yes. Wow. yes. And so it is clear from the context, when you put it together with Deuteronomy, Absolutely. that it is, must be yes. the, the ceremonial law with the Sabbath days, like um, they offered, um, all these various Sabbath days that they had, and the feasts and the meat offerings and so forth. Critical point. Critical, and that is why four heads are better than three. Right. You see. And also, if you remember that when Christ was crucified, the yes. veil of the temple was rent, right. signifying that the, the temple services came to an end. And all these ceremonial laws were related to the temple. You know, you had to come yes. to Jerusalem and you had to with the temple to perform them. So we know that if the temple is no more in operation, then the ceremonial laws are no longer in operation themselves. Absolutely. All right, do we have any more questions? Or, yes. yes, there is one here. It says here, wasn't the law nailed to the cross, including the Sabbath law? If we believe in the cross and salvation, why are, I think I want to say here, why are we still keeping the Sabbath? Tenji on FB. Facebook. All right. Good, very good question. And um, it pro it, that probably came in before uh, we just answered it because we just addressed that one. It's, it's the same one in Colossians 2. Mm -hmm. uh, what was nailed to the cross were the, and the handwritings that were against us. The Ten Commandments were never ever referred to as the handwritings that were against us. As Elder said, as our dear friend Frederick um, said, what was referred to as that, the handwriting that was against us, were those ceremonial laws that Moses wrote in Numbers and Deuteronomy and, um, and, and Leviticus. Those were the witnesses against them, the handwritings that were against them, containing all the ceremonies. Those were what were nailed to the cross and not what God, Jesus, I would even dare say himself, wrote with his own fingers on tables of stone, which are the moral laws, which we read yesterday in James chapter 2, is the royal law, the law of liberty. That's what it's called in the law of liberty, which will be the standard of the judgment. In fact, Elrond, I just want to emphasize that while Christ was on earth, he embraced and endorsed the Ten Commandments. He made it clear that not one jot nor tittle shall go. His law will remain. And he referred, that was in reference to the Ten Commandments. He came to fulfill it, not to do away with it, but to establish it. Thank you. And that, and that, that was a good one, Tenji. Tenji on Facebook. So, so, uh, so keep watching, Tenji. I know that you're going to have more questions as we do the other lessons. God bless you. We're happy to have you. All right, so that's it for tonight. We are going to pull the curtains down and so it will send you home so that you can be refreshed for the new week, work week tomorrow. Um, God bless you. See you on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we look at the, um, the mystery, the, the, um, the spiritual Babylon. Uh, mystery, uh, mystery Babylon. Mystery, mystery Babylon is what we look at Wednesday. God bless you. See you then. We hand over now to Roy who will close us out for this evening.